Chapter 781 Loyalty or Wisdom Part 1 Just as I thought. You know, squad, that was simple mastery, something that even fake mages know how to do. Hit me, Faluel said. Lith flicked his finger, sending a small shard of ice against her. Faluel's eyes turned blue and the shard went through her as if she was a ghost before turning around and hitting Litha's forehead with enough strength to make him bleed. What the fuck? He blurted out. Dominance is the ability to not only take control of a spell, but also of its mana. Faluel explained, With dominance, I can return the spells sent against me to their casters, killing them on the spot. Most mages are so used to be immune to their own mana that they don't even bother defending against it. Lith then told her about the god's will array he had faced in Kula and how it had been even stronger than Arthan's sword. That's exactly what dominance is, but as you witnessed yourself, such a perfect form requires too much energy to be of practical use. Faluel couldn't believe such an ancient and idiotic race could have stolen the Hydra secret. The idea of how many of her kind had to have suffered and fallen at the hand of the ODI made her wish to be able to resurrect them just to kill them over and over again. Dominance is a great tool, but it's not all powerful. As you have noticed, only spells without willpower can be easily hijacked, but that it's only the first step. The second step consists in injecting your mana along with your will into a spell. You must use enough to make it harmful for the opponent, but not so much to replace all of its mana with your own, like the ODI did. Otherwise, it would be much easier to dodge and cast it yourself since the mana cost would be more than doubled. Another thing that you must consider is that dominance can rarely be used to affect spells imbued with willpower. That's because just like the ODI, you would need to inject it not only with mana, but also with enough will of your own to overwrite that imprinted in the spell. Since most tier 5 spells are as fast as they are lethal, standing still is not a wise move. Unless you're suicidal, of course. Lith had experienced the fear of losing control of his own spells against Thrud and the ODI, so he immediately realized how powerful dominance was. Tier 5 spells were uncommon, and most of them could be used solely if certain prerequisites were met. Most magical battles were based only on Tier 3 and 4 spells, with Tier 5 magic used mostly as finishers. Dominance could easily turn the tide of a battle. So, are you going to teach me dominance? Lith asked. Yes and no. I'm going to teach you how to activate it only because it's the only way you can learn how to avoid using it in the presence of witnesses. You must always kill those who see you use dominance. Us hydras are considered to be part of the lesser dragons because we lack origin flames and flight, but no one knows about dominance. I'd like for things to stay that way. Faluel said. You're not going to teach me even if I become your apprentice? The words waste of time were appearing in Litha's mind again. If I take you as my apprentice, I'll teach you dominance as well as spirit spells, but only once you're ready. First, you'd have to focus on our common specializations, healing and forge mastering. Faluel took a bite from one of the plates in front of her. Such was her grace that even the simple act of eating was a pleasure to watch. Yet what all of her beauty managed to do was to make him miss Camilla more with each second. After the night at Protector's house, every positive emotion he felt reminded him of her. Our specializations? Lith asked. Your memories had a great effect on Protector's mind. He sought my help because I'm a master healer and forge master. There's a reason why legends say that hydras can regenerate two heads if one gets cut off. She giggled. You offer is very alluring, but as long as I'm serving my time in the army, I can't spend much time here. Moreover, I doubt you would do it for free. Lith said, obtaining a nod in reply. One more thing before discussing my apprenticeship. Why do you say when I'm ready? Are dominance and spirit spells that hard? Very hard. Faluel nodded. They are both techniques that are mostly situational and require an outstanding amount of focus. More importantly, they both require you to do everything without the help of the world energy. So far, to cast your spells you only needed to mix you mana with elemental energy, whereas these two disciplines work each in a way of its own. Dominance requires you to identify and infiltrate with your mana and willpower the focus points of a spell. Too little and you will be struck down like a moron, too much and you'll spend more mana than if you cast the spell yourself. As for spirit spells, they are entirely made of your own energy, so they are really mana expensive. 
Just like dominance, spirit spells have to be used only when necessary. Rookies tend to get excited and abuse them, ending up dead. That or exhausted first and dead later. Lith pondered her words. It was true that without the aid of a medium like the ODI and Thrud did, a single mistake could lead to taking the full power of a potentially lethal spell. The only thing he wanted to learn as soon as possible was how to make barriers out of spirit magic. He had seen plenty of mages, awakened and not, creating them thanks to magical items, and even though that kind of protections was mana-consuming, they were the ultimate shield. Unlike earth magic they could be used in midair, they couldn't be pierced by heavy objects like happened to air barriers, and they blocked the entirety of the damage whereas darkness magic could only weaken incoming attacks. Let's start with dominance. Faluel said, I noticed that in your hybrid form your eyes are always burning with elemental energy, which is good if you have to use dominance and terrible if you need to hide it. Try to shut them down. Lith remained in his human form, making his eyes turn red, then black, and lastly blue, to remember the feeling of controlling the elemental energy. After Floria had pointed out to him that his eyes sometimes remained lit, he had practiced controlling the phenomenon, at least for his human form. It had been quite easy since when not in his hybrid body, he needed great focus to achieve such a state due to his lack of attunement with the elements. Then, he shapeshifted and tried to make his eyes go back to plain yellow. Much to his surprise, he only managed to depower the blue eye, no matter how hard he tried. The moment the water element left it, the eye closed shut against Litha's will. What the heck? Why did it close and why can't I turn them back to yellow? Lith asked. Extra limbs are hard to manage, especially when you're not born with them. Faluel explained. Chapter 782 Loyalty or Wisdom Part 2 Every time a Hydra gains a new head, we need time to learn how to see, think, and speak properly without it conflicting with our other heads. The same stands for your eyes. You're not used to see with three of them, so right now the blue eye only serves as a medium for the elemental energy. As for the other two, it just takes practice. I'll teach you a meditation technique that should help you with it. The Hydra taught Lith how to feel the connection with the single elements rather than with the world energy as a whole. Once he grasped the basics, Faluel had him revert to his human form. Are you really not going to teach me how to dominate spells? Lith asked. Don't you have enough on your plate already to venture into a new field of magic? Faluel rebuked him. We'll think about that later. Now I'm more interested in listening to your answer. My answer to what? To my predictable offer for an apprenticeship, of course. She said with a warm smile. It depends on many things. Like, do I have to take your tests like Protector did? How much do you know about runes and how long would my apprenticeship last? Since I'm offering to take you under my care, there would be no admittance tests, but plenty of assignments to prove your mettle. As for the runes, I told you that I come from a long line of forge masters. My family doesn't trade its secrets with other awakened, beasts or not, but we share our discoveries among ourselves. Our legacy is better than that of Royal Forge Master, but unlike them, don't expect me to share it completely with you. You would be an apprentice, not a member of the family. I would teach you everything you need to be plenty capable of working on your own, but that's it. Faluel's words were a punch in the stomach for Lith. He was basically at a crossroads where he had to pick whether to join the Hydra to obtain an incomplete knowledge or the Royal Forge Master's ranks for a full education. It wasn't an easy choice, especially since at least Faluel was sincere and she would teach him what she had promised with no strings attached, whereas the royals might require from him demonstrations of loyalty before letting him learn the best techniques. On top of that, becoming a royal forge master was a commitment for life, something that Lith couldn't take lightly. Don't worry about time. Faluel snapped him out of his reverie. I'll keep you as an apprentice as long as it takes. It could take months as well as years, but beware. While humans demand loyalty, awaken require wisdom. Fail even one of my tests and I'll kick you out. Seriously? Lith was flabbergasted. The difference between the Hydra and the army was getting thinner by the second. Seriously? She nodded. I didn't awaken most of my children, nor did I teach them anything but the basics. Do you have any idea what kind of damage can one of us do with the wrong knowledge? I'm honestly amazed by how mature you are despite your young age. 
Valuel had no idea Lith was currently in his third life, and he was glad to keep things that way. He then activated Death Vision out of curiosity to see if such a powerful creature had any weak point he could exploit. Yet aside from a very slow aging process, Valuel appeared to be just fine. And that's why I brought you here, the Hydra said. I can't let the humans get their hands on a valuable awaken that might be one of us, plus they must never learn either about dominance or your origin flames. If you manage to master them, to learn how to use them to purify instead of just destroy, I'm willing to trade with you according to the services you can provide me. The inception of this chapter's publication is linked to N. O. Vel. V. I. N. My flames in exchange for what, exactly? That's on you. She shrugged. Knowledge, artifacts, gold, materials. Just state your price and we'll bargain from there. Wait, didn't you just say that you wouldn't share your secrets with me as your apprentice? Why would you give them to me for just my flames? It was all too good to be true. Lith was certain that there was a catch. Indeed. Yet do you expect that any of my suppliers don't ask for proper compensation? I'm well aware that any Awakened that buys an artifact from me can study its runes and pseudo-core, but my forge-mastering techniques aren't so easily reproduced. My family had millennia to learn how to protect its secrets. Also, you're overestimating yourself. If you want gold, I'll give you mountains of it, but if you want knowledge, it takes more than a few breaths of fire to get some. Not to mention that you have no idea how to use your flames and that I can't help you with that nor I'm willing to, unless you become my faithful apprentice. Valuel was again sincere, and her words made a lot of sense. Just like Lith would give Orion a skinwalker armor in exchange for a decent blade, trading goods and trading knowledge were worlds apart. Both of them would need a lot of work to hope and steal the other's secrets. I'll let you know once I'm done with the army, or at least as soon as I master Origin Flames. Lith replied. He had learned much more than he had hoped to, yet much less than he would have liked to. One last question. I'm practicing runes on my own, and there's something I'm struggling with. How do I make them invisible? Faluel's eyes lighted with interest at those words. The wormling was even more promising than she had thought. Just by his words, she was able to understand that Lith had gained access to both old and modern runes. It was an amazing feat that put him in front of the greatest hurdle for a self-taught runesmith. What an interesting fellow. I'm really curious to see how he will develop. There's no harm in giving him a hand on such a trivial. What does a human do here, mother? A deep voice derailed her train of thought. I hope he's just your lunch because if he's your new plaything, I'll be truly disappointed. First a dog and now a vermin? Not even you should stoop this low. Lith. Allow me to introduce you to one of the reasons why Emperor Beasts and humans are not so different. This is my one of my sons, Cedra. I never awakened nor taught him any of the family secrets. Guess why? Faluel's serene face was suddenly twisted in annoyance and her voice used sarcasm. Cedra, this is Lith. He is a self-awakened that I'm willing to take in as my apprentice, hence he has already bested you twice. Cedra looked at Lith as if a steaming pile of shit had found its way on his favorite couch, whereas Lith looked at the young Hydra with life and death vision before losing interest. The pleasure is all yours, Cedra. Can you answer my question, please? Lith asked. You have no idea how to engrave runes, correct? Faluel ignored her son as well, focusing on how deep Lith's ignorance was about the art of runesmithing. Chapter 783 Gifts and Knowledge Part 1 I've received no training about runesmithing, but I've found enough relics to use as learning tools. My only problem is that I've no access to modern runes, so. Cedra couldn't understand how so many powerful creatures could favor weaklings rather than their own flesh and blood. He was young, but he had already witnessed several of his siblings and friends die. All because their parents, the very same people who had given them life, had refused to give them the knowledge that was rightfully theirs. In his eyes, the source of the Awakened's decline wasn't due to the progress made by fake mages. He believed that the old fossils who had power clung to it and refused to share their knowledge with the young because they were afraid to lose their privileged position. I won't stand being ignored. Cedra roared, stomping his foot toward his mother. Faluel's eyes burned with power as she said, Be quiet. Her voice was calm, and yet it carried so much power that Cedra found himself kneeling with his head on the floor. 
Lith was surprised noticing that she hadn't used magic, but some kind of killing intent. I'm really sorry for my son's rudeness, and I'm willing to explain to you the basics of the basics of runesmithing as an apology. Do you know what's the main difference between warden magic and ford mastering? She asked. Lith could only shake his head and admit his ignorance. The question was apparently simple, yet its answer was bound to be far from obvious. Warden magic uses runes to create magical formations just as forge masters use them to bind a metal to their will, but that's as far as the analogy goes. A warden uses runes to hold their energy and create extraordinary effects, whereas a forge master uses them to alter the properties of a material. Ancient runes, the ones that are visible to the naked eye, were akin to warden runes, placing the enchantment on the surface of the metal rather than inside of it, to not tamper with the mana pathways that the bonding process creates. You can think of them as a permanent array to complement the strength of the spells imbued within an artifact. Modern runes, instead, even though they are still carved on the surface of an item, they exert their energy inward rather than outward, and that's why they are invisible to normal means. Also, this way they are able to alter the properties of both the metal and its mana circulatory system so that once the enchantment is applied, the final result is given from the synergy between the runes and the pseudo-core. Old runes can only add an effect, whereas modern runes are able to blend together with the pseudo-core and the mana crystals, creating something that's greater than the sums of its single parts. Faluel said, Does this mean that old runes are useless? Lith moaned at the thought that all of his findings inside Heriol were for naught. Gods, no. Faluel chuckled. You can apply modern forge mastering methods with old runes. It will make them invisible and preserve their effect, but that will not change the fact that such runes are outdated. It would be like crafting a sword following an ancient blueprint. The sword will still cut, but it can't match a modern masterpiece, no matter how good the smith is. The fear that had kept Cedra at bay was washed away by the shock and then by his unbridled outrage. It wasn't just the fact that his mother was explaining to a stranger things that she had always refused to teach him that was driving him insane, so much as the realization that the human was able to understand her words while he could not. In his human form, Sidra was an overly handsome man in his mid-twenties 1.9 meters, 6 feet 3 inches, tall, with golden hair and a well-trimmed beard. Despite his young age, he had already achieved a cyan core and a second head. His hair had streaks of both red and orange, making him appear as if a sun god descended among the mortals. His body twisted as it increased in size, reverting to his real form. The two heads stared at the human in hatred, standing over five meters, 17 foot, tall. Cedra's stumpy lower body was all muscles and his claws were piercing the stone, such was the strength that he was exerting to overpower his mother's command. Faluel sighed while Lith made the young Hydra's fury turn into bloodlust. Wow, he's really small compared to you. Is it because he's young or is he a hybrid? The question was incredibly rude, implying that no pure-blooded Hydra could be that puny and that Cedra had to be born from a lesser race. It's normal for someone who has yet to live a quarter of century. Faluel said. He's not bad, just stupid and conceited. The two heads plunged down with their mouths open, revealing a maw of poisoned fangs. Hydras bore more than just their appearance in common with snakes. Faluel struck her son's body with her opened palm, paralyzing him on the spot. Before you go, we should exchange our communication runes. Faluel took her council amulet out of her dimensional item, and so did Lith. If anything related to Awakened happens, feel free to give me a call. I'm officially your contact with the Emperor Beast's Council, after all. Don't forget what we have discussed today. Her choice of words told Lith that she didn't trust Cedra with his secret. I've got tons of metals that need smelting, and I could really use a hand. What if he bothers me once I get out of here? Lith asked. Then beat him an inch from death and call me. The last inch is my burden for failing as both a parent and a teacher. The coldness in her voice sent shivers down Cedra's spine. Lith had no idea what was going on, but he could feel that Faluel was deeply embarrassed. Her pearly pink cheeks had now a tinge of red that made her look less ethereal and much more charming. The idiot already earned me a free lesson. It's better to strike the iron while it's still hot. Lith thought. One last thing. 
I know that you can't bestow knowledge upon me for free, but I could really use a magic dictionary book for this. He took one of the pages from Heriol's booklet out of his pocket dimension and showed it to Faluol. This is just the old language. The Hydra couldn't understand the reason for such a request. You can find plenty of tomes about it in any decent library. Been there, done that. Lith replied. You can find tomes about it, yes, but it's still a dead language. Dictionaries are not common, even less those who contain words related to magic. If I ask for them, I'm bound to be exposed. Humans. Faluel muttered in disgust while a pair of thick books flew from an adjacent cave into her hands. I'm fluent in the old language, so I don't really need them. You can keep the dictionaries as long as you need. Lith put them straight inside Solaspedia, discovering that one was a book about common words and the second was solely about the magical jargon. Thank you very much. He gave Faluel a deep bow before leaving the cave. Old runes were outdated, but beggars couldn't be choosers. Chapter 784 Gifts and Knowledge Part 2 I was almost certain that she would have refused to help, keeping me on a short leash and yet. I need to ask Protector about the beast's customs because something strange just happened here. The moment Lith left, Faluel released her son from the spell that had been restraining Sidra until that moment. She couldn't bear the thought to raise her hand against her own child, but discipline had to be enforced. How are you insulting me in front of an esteemed guest? Even attacking them while they are under my protection in my own home. The seven-headed Hydra was back to her full size, so big that even in his emperor beast form, Sidra looked like a snotty brat in front of an adult. You say that you despise humans for their arrogance, yet you behave just like one of them. How could you breach the sacred host-guest relationship that our race holds sacred? Did you take the human treachery along with that ridiculous eye candy form? The seven heads spoke in unison, their voices roaring like a choir of angered gods. But mother. Sidra had never seen his parent enraged before. His earlier arrogance had disappeared like snow under a scorching sun. No buts. She roared, cutting him short. Because of your foolishness, I had to give more than I could take to not taint my honor. What kind of master can I possibly be if I can't keep order in my own house? What lessons am I supposed to impart if I'm incapable of teaching how to behave to my own children? You embarrass me for the last time. Get out of this house and don't return until you've found a master willing to awaken you. Only then will I know that there is at least one person on Mogur who thinks you've proven yourself worthy of becoming an awakened. Both mother and son knew that the assigned task was arduous. The older an emperor beast got, the more powerful the master needed to be to allow them to survive their awakening. Moreover, powerful beings were usually very picky, just like Faluol. For someone who thinks himself of a WIRM, you're nothing more than a worm. Prove me wrong if you can. Faluol's words struck a nerve, hurting Sidra more than any spell could. All the lesser dragons suffered from an inferiority complex towards their forefathers and dreamed of claiming for themselves the ancient title describing them, WRM. At the same time, being wingless creatures, often resembling more a snake rather than a dragon, Worm was the worst slur that could be inflicted upon them. A squishy, helpless creature forced to hide and eat dirt to not be eaten by predators. Erna's manner, later that day. After saying goodbye to Ryman, Celia, and their kids, Lith could finally relax after days and days of careful preparation against the human council. He hated to admit it, but he was going to miss Floria's house big time. It had a huge library, all the training facilities he could dream of, and was full of people that would take care of him, unlike it happened when he was in Lusha. There someone would always get hurt, need his help or his attention. The only exceptions were the Verhen kids, that despite the protection their enchanted clothes offered, they often managed to do all three things at once. Moreover, at the manner he would get to share with Camilla every moment of respite she had. After their talk at Protector's house, she had become even more loving and affectionate, to the point of being almost clingy. Yet it didn't bother Lith since he had expected Camilla to treat him differently, at least at first, but never that she would become kinder. Solas was working on the translation of the booklet from Huriel while Lith was practicing spirit spells. This time they were splitting their focus for a good reason. 
The booklet was only about practical lessons and explained only the bare minimum of theory behind the experiments that the students needed to understand how the spell worked. Expanding a few lines into a proper explanation of an unknown discipline required a tremendous amount of focus and brain power. Solus could do it only by constantly switching the books from Solaspedia in the Arna's library and vice versa. She was giving her all to understand the foundations of runesmithing, going over and over the first chapter to make sure she hadn't missed anything. If Lith were to work on the following chapters, it would be a mechanical work that could make important details be lost in translation, forcing Solus to do them over. After reviewing his memories about spirit spells, Lith preferred to work on replicating those he had seen in action and then share his discoveries with Solus, just like she would do about runesmithing. No wonder Faluel wasn't willing to teach me. This stuff is damn hard. Lith thought during a common break. Without the world energy, every part of the spell must be imbued with will and shaped with precision. Elemental magic is akin to using a mold to give shape to clay, whereas spirit magic requires to start from scratch every time. Without elemental energy as a guideline missing a single focus point of the spell, it's enough to turn it into a waste of mana. To add insult to injury, each failure consumes roughly the same energy of five tier three spells, and every time I'm forced to stop to understand what went wrong. Same here. Solus sighed. Whoever wrote this book assumed that the student had a knowledge that we currently lack, even after our conversation with Faluel. Still, I'm positive that once I understand the foundations of runesmithing and with a bit of practice, things should go smoothly. Lith nodded. Their bigger obstacle wasn't engraving the runes so much as identifying their different patterns and their properties. Once they managed to do that, every time they met an opponent with a runed weapon, Solus's mana sense would allow them to learn its secrets. Unfortunately, as long as they failed to understand the runes' meaning, how they worked both separately and as a whole, the words of power would be nothing but gibberish. Lith took a deep breath with invigoration before resuming his practice of spirit magic. He had only seen Garen use two spirit spells, a barrier and a mind link. Solus had studied their matrix with mana sense and Lith had more or less understood how the mana had to be manipulated. Yet a mind link required to link two mana cores, making it too dangerous. Since Garen hadn't used it as a means of attack, there wasn't the risk of damaging Litha's subject, but the concrete chance of sharing more than he liked to. So his only remaining option was the barrier. In theory, it was a simple matter, but putting it into practice proved to be far from easy. Barrier spells were all similar in their matrix, requiring to give to a specific elemental energy shape, size, and thickness. Yet Litha's problem was that now he needed to give substance to something that was ethereal by nature and to give it form away from his body. So far, all of his attempts that didn't use tendrils of mana to shape his creations had failed. Chapter 785 Grudge Part 1 Baby Steps Lith thought, using his own fingers as a scaffolding for the spirit magic barrier. Soon his left hand was covered by a thin and eerie green glow. This stuff wouldn't block a pen stroke and is thinner than a hair, but it's still a barrier, he thought. Now let's try to move it away from my fingers. A sudden knocking on his door made him yelp and shattered the infant spirit spell. Nice job. Solus laughed. If we ever have to use it in battle, we must hope that our enemy is as silent as a mouse. Lith, do you mind if I come in? Floria asked. Not at all. Lith tried to open the door with a spirit spell and failed miserably. Even from barely a few meters of distance, the green glow was so faint that Solus's mana sense could barely perceive it. Do you want to come down for dinner? You've been locked in here all day and I was beginning to worry. Besides, Mom and Camilla will be here in a while, Floria said. Only then did Lith look out of the window above his desk and notice that it was way past sunset. The realization drained his energy and made his stomach grumble. He had been so absorbed in his work that he had failed to notice the passing of time. Thank you, Floria. If it wasn't for you, I'd starve. I'll join you in a minute. Lith put away all the papers Solus had worked on, leaving Floria amazed by the amount of research he had done and by the amount of mana still lingering in the room. It was enough to make the hair on her neck stand up. How the heck can Lith write and weave spells at the same time? She thought. 
Either each one of his eyes has a mind of its own or being a hybrid is just one of his secrets. She couldn't even consider the idea that Lith had lied to her. After all, she knew that there were still many oddities about him that even having two life forces couldn't explain. One more thing. Tomorrow is Yandra's funeral and you told me that she had entrusted you her last message. I've been tasked to return her body to her family. Do you want to come along? Floria asked. Lith nodded and followed her downstairs. He hadn't known Yandra Maffail for long plus they had started off the wrong foot. Yet she had been the first to recognize his talent and offer him to inherit her legacy. Even though death had prevented her from keeping her part of the bargain, Lith was willing to fulfill her dying wish. Mogar didn't have a specific set of clothes for funerals nor specific rituals to pay a final farewell to the departed among its customs. Some would mourn them and cry while others would throw a party to celebrate the life of their beloved ones rather than focus on the way they had died. Much to everyone's surprise, Yandra's funerals took place at the Black Griffin Academy instead that at her home. Lith and Floria wore their uniforms, while Quilla wore her white griffin assistant professor clothes. Floria had to answer the Maffail family and the Black Griffin for having failed to protect Yandra, while Lith was there only to impart them her last words and check how Raynor was doing. Quilla had no reason to be there, but she had insisted to come because it was a rare occasion to speak with both Lith and Floria without arousing Freya's suspicions. She was itching to learn the latest news about Litha's relationship with Camilla, but between their respective work plus Camilla's and Freya's meddling, she had never gotten the opportunity to question him. Until now. The Black Griffin Auditorium was as big as a football field now that Headmaster Onia had removed all the furniture to make space for her guests and the banquet. She had even replaced the Black Griffin's banners from the walls, replacing them with magical tapestries recounting Yandra's numerous achievements since the day she had enrolled. The enchanted fibers rearranged themselves cyclically, each forming a slideshow about a specific event. The room was full of high officials from the army and the association who had come to pay their respects. Due to the several professors who had met their fate during the expedition, only the faculty of the academy was truly grieving. Attending a funeral was a sad event, whereas attending six of them in as many days was mostly annoying. Floria had a stern look as she apologized and bowed to all of Yandra's friends. She didn't share her colleague's attitude and had taken part in each memorial service as if it was the first one. Even though she was aware that predicting the survival of a mad civilization was impossible, it didn't make her feel any less guilty. So, how did Camilla take the news? Quilla empathized with her sister's situation, but she had never been close to Yandra, and she had waited too long for her answers. Lith had never been fond of public displays of affection, so even if they lived under the same roof, Quilla had no idea how his relationship fared. Better and worse than I thought. Lith replied while Floria almost chalked on her drink in surprise. She was curious as much as Quilla was, but she was too tactful to resort to such straightforward questions. Better because she has decided to accept me. She never considered breaking up or taking a break. Worse because she was royally pissed when she discovered that three more people knew about me and you were one of them. Lith watched Quilla in the eyes, managing to keep a straight face. What? She worried about me and not Floria? Why? Quilla was the one among the Ernest sisters who had the best relationship with Camilla, so she couldn't understand such a reaction. Exactly because of Floria. She assumed that you and I, you know, bow chicka wow wow. We what? Quilla had no idea what Litha's tune meant. That the two of us at some time had shared a similar degree of affection. Lith tried to be as delicate as he could since the three of them were surrounded by a bunch of bored strangers. Gods, no. Quilla couldn't stop herself from laughing at the idea. Floria and I might not share the same blood, but that would be too messed up. Floria started chuckling as well, allowing herself to forget for a moment about her sad duty. Camilla really is a strong and wise woman, she thought. I guess that she has learned from her harsh past rather than just be scarred from it. A certain Verhen guy should follow her lead and stop being so afraid of... A loud tongue clicking made her blush in embarrassment. Headmaster Onia was staring at her in spite. Laughing at the memorial service of someone who died because of your incompetence is beyond tasteless, Captain Ernest. 
I guess that your household truly deserves the nickname of the Royal Branch family, if not even six dead professors from the great academies can put a dent into your brilliant career. Headmaster Marth told me many great things about you. Yet it turns out that the only thing you are good at is running away, even at the cost of paving your way out with dead bodies. Chapter 786 Grudge Part 2 You have my word that we'll learn together how far your household's power goes, because I'll be damned before letting this matter slide. N0V3LTR0VE served as the original host for this chapter's release on N0V3LB1N. Headmaster Onia turned her back to Floria without giving her the opportunity to reply to the headmaster's allegations, but even if she didn't, Floria lacked the will to do so. Even though Constable Griffin had reassured Floria that her service record would not be affected by Kula's failure, most headmasters didn't agree with Tyrus's decision. After their return, the assistants had told everything about their imprisonment. The part about how both professors and the members of the army hadn't hesitated one second to leave them behind during their escape attempts had caused quite a stir. Not only was Floria the officer in charge of the mission, but she was also alive and well. People were trying to pin all the blame on her since the professors were already dead and no one wanted to taint their memory. I'm sorry, sis. This is all my fault, Quilla said, inwardly cursing her own stupid mouth. Don't worry, Quilla. She was just waiting for an excuse to spit her venom. This has nothing to do with you. At this point, I'm used to such treatment. Floria said with a sad smile. Lyth saw past her stoic expression and noticed all the pain she was hiding. The thought that he had left her alone to face such an unfair treatment stung at him hard. While Lyth had spent his days since his return only obsessing with how to deal with Camilla and Quilla, Floria had always been there for him. She had listened to all of his rants and worries, even making sure that he would eat properly. He had forgotten that unlike him, Floria treasured her career. A lot of people resented Lith for the most disparate reasons, but he didn't care for it one bit since his job as a ranger was temporary. Floria, instead, had worked her whole life toward that goal, making countless sacrifices to prove herself to be more than just a spoiled girl who used her family name to rise the army ranks. Don't worry about Onia, Captain Ernas. She's always been an uptight prick, Lord Maphail said, taking everyone by surprise. Not only because they expected the widower to be angry, but also because he looked more bored than most people in the room. Yandra's husband was a man in his late sixties of average height, with grizzled hair and a well-trimmed beard. There was no trace of pain or rage in his chestnut eyes, only bitterness. You are not at fault. It's just that to cover the shame of losing their cream of the crop staff, the academies need a scapegoat. As for my wife, don't feel guilty about her fate. She died as she lived, working. His words were cold enough that they sounded cruel. Thank you, Lord Maphail, Floria said, pondering carefully her words. I want to assure you that Professor Yandra's contribution was. Save it for the memorial speech. Rainer told me about her final days, and that was more than enough for me. He replied before turning to Lith, Ranger Verhen, I presume? You were her last pet project. I hope she treated you well. At those words, a small group of people joined the conversation. They were all dressed with the colors of the Maphail household and were looking at the three Kula veterans with an odd mix of envy and annoyance. Yandra's children were old enough to have children of their own, and along with the resemblance with their late mother, they all bore a stern expression. She did. Lith nodded. I'm here to pay my respects to Yandra and to pass on to you her final words. Nice. Less than a month and you are already on a first-name basis. Said a man in his late forties while wrinkling his nose so much that Lith almost expected him to spit at any moment. Lord Maphail squeezed his eldest son's shoulder and forced him to shut up before asking Lith to proceed. Here? Wouldn't he it be better somewhere a little more private? Lith asked. Here is perfect, Lord Maphail said. Lith performed a series of hand gestures and gibberish before materializing in the middle of the circle of people a hologram of Yandra's final moments, doing his best to imitate her voice. Please, tell my children that I didn't abandon them and that my last thoughts, even this last caress was for them. The hologram said, her voice kind and caring despite the pain from her deep wounds. 
tell them that I'm sorry I could never be the mother they deserved. I wasted my life, always giving priority to the wrong things. In the end, I let everyone down. My family, Rainer, even you. If only I could have one more. Lith did his best to express all of her honesty and regret, yet his audience seemed underwhelmed. Thank you, Ranger Verhen. Lord Mephail gave both Lith and Floria a small bow, quickly followed by the rest of the family. I can assure you that neither of you will have problems from us. Between our support and Rainer's testimony, you can rest assured that Onia will not be a problem. How can you all be so cold? Quilla was the only one moved to tears. You have literally seen her die, and yet you don't care about how she got wounded or if she was avenged? We know about you, Mage Ernas, said a woman in her late thirties while wiping Quilla's tears with a handkerchief. She was wearing a gentle smile and a motherly expression on her face. Even Lith was shocked seeing that Yandra's daughter was more touched by Quilla's words rather than those of her own mother. You're an orphan, so you probably assume that family is something sacred, but it's not. My mother died to me a long time ago, after I understood that she loved her students and long-lost civilizations more than me. She spent time with me only to force me to learn magic, losing interest as soon as she realized that I wasn't gifted. The opposite of love isn't hate, but indifference, and I've long since grown indifferent to my mother as much as she was to me. I'm not cold, child. It's just that I stopped grieving her years ago. Why do you think we're holding the funeral here? Lord Mephail asked. She spent more time at the Black Griffin than at our home, making these people her real family. I don't know if her regret was sincere and honestly, I don't care. It's too little and too late for it to matter. Once Floria, Quilla, and Lith were alone again, they remained silent for a long time, each one of them lost in their thoughts. When I was little, I hated how Mom always tried to mess with my life, ordering me around and trying to force me to do what she considered to be the best thing for me. Floria said after a while, Now that I'm old enough, however, I finally understand why she always worked her ass off to dine with us and spent every moment of her free time badgering me. It was her twisted, manipulative, relentless way to be an important part of my life. Can we leave? Quilla asked. Suddenly, I feel like hugging mom and telling her I love her. Chapter 787 Javik Part 1 Lith had conflicting feelings since he had walked more than one mile in Yandra's shoes. Ever since he was a small child, he had always chased his ambitions, spending with his loved ones less time the more he grew in power. He was worried about making Yandra's same mistakes and waking up one day to realize how much he had lost only when it was too late. Ragu's words about how short-lived humans were compared to Awaken echoed in his mind, making Lith second-guess his path in life for the first time in years. After they returned home, Lith decided to take a bit of time off from his research and spend it with his family. His leave was about to end, and with all that had happened, he had put Camilla's first for too long. He wanted to make sure that his family knew how much they meant to him, even though it meant falling behind on his schedule. A few days later, while they were having their afternoon tea in Quilla's quarters, Freya waltzed triumphantly in while holding a scroll in her right hand. It wasn't easy, but I finally did it. I found a place that satisfies everyone's requirements for our leisure trip. Due to spring, Rahar Caves have become a dungeon infested by a still unidentified race of monsters. And how is that relevant? Lith asked. Rahar Caves are near the trade city of Javik, which means we can sleep in a good hotel and that Camilla can come to us anytime she wants thanks to the city gate, smartass. Freya replied, I get that part. Lith rebuked her. I mean, why monsters and more importantly, why us? Can't they deal with it on their own? Of course they can, but that's not the point. Quilla wants to practice offensive magic under supervision. It's not like she can skulk on city roofs and hope for crimes to happen, nor she can wait for the next nud job to take a swing at her. Monsters are the perfect practice target. They are strong, ugly, and you don't feel guilty when you kill them because they treat every living creature like we treat our dinner. I'm okay with it. Floria sighed. I need to vent quite a bit of frustration and simply training won't do. I just got suspended from duty until further notice. You what? The others blurted out in unison. Headmaster Onia has been true to her word, Floria said. 
A special committee has been formed to evaluate the events in Kula and assess if there was something that could have been done differently. Until their investigation is over, I'm back being a civilian. I call bullshit, Lith said. A bunch of paper pushers can't judge a life or death situation by reading reports while drinking tea in the safety of their office. Yet that's exactly what is going to happen. Don't worry, sis, Quilla said while hugging her. I'm sure that mom and dad would rather kill them than let something bad happen to you. Plus, there's Constable Griffin on your side. Floria didn't reply. She was well aware of how influential the Erna's household was, but hoping that, despite the fact that so many important assets of the kingdom had been slaughtered like fish in a barrel, no one would be held accountable for it was just naive thinking. Someone had to take responsibility for what had happened. Barian was too high in the chain of command while her soldiers were just grunts. Hence Floria was the only living member of the expedition who could be reasonably pinned with the blame. Out of curiosity, what were the other requirements you had to fulfill? Lith asked Freya to lighten the mood and not let Floria dwell too much on the bad news. Floria wanted a place rich of natural treasures for her forge mastering experiments, and I wanted something that would look on the resume of my crystal shield guild. Freya said while handing each one of them a mana stone shaped like a round shield. You're all recruited, by the way. When do we leave? Floria asked. Whenever we want. All in favor of moving out at dawn, Freya said. Her proposal was accepted unanimously, and then they resumed their business as usual. Lith went back to his research. Floria secluded herself inside Orion's forge to keep her mind busy. Quilla continued with her Tier 5 spells training schedule, and Freya started to make arrangements for their trip. Later, that night Lith discussed the last details of his plans with Camilla. They had just returned from Lusha, where they dined every other day with both their families, making everyone incredibly happy but Lith. He felt like the misunderstanding was getting worse, just like his mother's expectations were growing by the day, but there wasn't much he could do. He wanted to spend some time with his relatives, and since Zinnia was their neighbor, it would have been incredibly rude to keep the two sisters apart. Do you think you can make it to Javik without stressing yourself too much? Lith asked. You're already working a lot, and I don't want to burden you with another chore. You're not a chore, silly, she said while putting her arms around his neck and kissing him. Besides, as long as you're waiting for me on the other side, stepping out of the Ernest's gate or Javix is the same. Damn, I have yet to leave and I miss you already, Lith said while running his hands on her back and then lower. Since when squeezing my butt is a form of goodbye? She giggled. I miss it already as well. He replied, happy of how easily a skinwalker armor could be taken off. The following morning the group reached Javak and went to check in at their luxurious hotel. It's a waste of money. Lith grumbled, cursing for not having thought about it beforehand. Why don't we just commute from here and the Arna's household instead of staying in a hotel? It's not a waste of money. Freya rebuked him. If we go back and forth, it would be as if we never left— Plus, everyone here needs to unwind big time. Maybe you live our home as a free resort, but for us is a constant reminder of our duty. Plus, parents. Agreed, said the other two women in unison. They loved Journey and Orion, but after spending so much time together, they were starting to feel like little girls again and itched for being treated as adults. Gods, it has been years since my last vacation. What about you guys? Floria said. I think it's my first. Quilla replied. Back when she was an orphan, survival was her priority, and once she had enrolled in the White Griffin Academy, she had never stopped practicing magic for more than a day. She had never traveled anywhere if not for work-related issues. Same, Lith said. Whenever he wasn't working for the army or his family, he had spent all of his free time inside his tower. All the more reason to not commute. You need to stay away from books and labs for a while. Just have fun, Freya said, leaving Lith flabbergasted. He had no idea how to have fun without a computer and some video games. Mogar offered little entertainment for someone like him who had no interest in arts. Chapter 788 Javik Part 2 Javik was an important city located in the southwest part of the Griffin Kingdom, only a few hundreds of kilometers from its borders with the Blood Desert. Freya had picked it because of its warm climate and abundance of natural resources. 
Also, it was far enough away from the borders to not have through customs inspections every time they needed a gate and dimensional magic could be employed within the city borders. The lack of strict safety measures had allowed the city to grow over time, making it a blend of old and new architectures. Unlike most cities of the kingdom, Javik wasn't divided into rims, but into districts. The trading district occupied the center of the city and extended all the way to the four city gates. Shops and their warehouses were usually adjacent to allow the merchants to keep an eye on their supplies since dimensional items were a two-edged blade. Contrary to what one could expect, the slum district was right next to the market. The bustling activity and the constant noise made it a horrible place to live. Yet it also made the housing so cheap that daily workers would manage to easily pay the rent and need only a few steps to reach their workplace, killing two birds with one stone. The residential area was right past the slums, using parks as a buffer and to further reduce the interaction between social classes. Farmers lived outside the city, near the fields they worked on, and too far away for the stench their cattle made to affect the citizens. The numerous guards patrolling the walls and the beautiful sight offered by the luscious forest that surrounded Javik made the outer district the most expensive place to live. Litha's Hotel, the Golden Dragon, was located in the outer district and occupied an entire 12 floors building. Freya had reserved the last floor of the hotel to enjoy the scenery and have an easier time moving by flight thanks to the rooftop doorway. What the fuck does this mean? Lith said when he noticed that there were only four rooms on the twelfth floor. A woman needs some space. You'll thank me once Camilla arrives. Poor girl, I bet you never brought her to a place this nice. Freya scoffed at Litha's cheapskate attitude. I work, she works, and whenever I get a leave, I've so much catch-up to do that I don't have time for this kind of shenanigans. I told you that I don't go on vacation. Good for you. It means you should have plenty of money since you never got the opportunity to spend it. Now stop whining and pick a room, she said, offering the four numbered keys to him. Lith actually picked three, giving the other two to Floria and Quilla, to make sure that Freya would be the further away as possible from him. Very mature of you, Lith, Freya said. I've good news and bad news, Solas said while laughing her ass off at Litha's expense. Give me the bad news first. Lith inwardly moaned. An image of the hotel's brochure and its prices appeared in Litha's mind. The sheer amount of zeros almost burned through his wallet. What about the good news? Lith was glad to have managed to sell several of his lesser creations lately. Even though they weren't made out of orichalcum, his custom-made skinwalker armor was highly sought after. Meals are included, and the whole hotel is covered by an air-blocking array. Your key makes so that you're the only one who can use dimensional magic or flight spells while in your room. It's enough to satisfy even your levels of paranoia. Also, the walls are soundproof. Meaning? That once you engage Camilla in battle, you don't have to worry about collateral damage. Solus thought. Lith blushed at the remark. He already found awkward when Solus played third wheel, but the idea that Quilla, whose room was adjacent to his, could hear something had completely escaped his mind. Not knowing how to reply, he glossed over the matter and entered his room. It looked like a five-room apartment with a hallway, a living room big enough to host a small party, a dining room, a sauna, a king-sized bedroom, and a bathroom. The walls were painted sunny yellow and the glass wall provided lots of natural light. The furniture was of simple design, but it was elegant and its quality wouldn't make them look bad, even in the Ernest house. Every room was large, airy, and well light. It was the first time Lith was in a classy hotel, so he remained quite surprised noticing that there were small cabinets for toiletries and all the common items provided by the hotel, but no wardrobes. Rich people had no need for them since they would store everything inside their own dimensional amulets. It left plenty of space to decorate the room and made them appear even larger than they were. Too bad there's no kitchen. I bet they aim to milk the customers with the room service. Lith thought after touring his room. He went back to the lobby, finding Quilla waiting alone in front of the floor's gate. The hotel had no elevator. It used a short-range dimensional device to allow people to move from a floor to another. Hey, Lith. How hard is clearing a dungeon? Quilla asked. For me, it's mostly boring. You must forget all the crap about mystical rooms and treasures. 
It's just a place infested with monsters. The only traps you'll find are those the monsters laid, and the only loot you can earn belong to those who failed to clear the dungeon. That's not what I asked you. I'm not looking for profits or excitement, only for the experience. For you, the hardest part will be just not falling for traps, ambushes, and avoiding that your spells hit us as well as the monsters. The good thing of going solo is that you don't have to worry about anyone but yourself. Lith said. Yeah, too bad that one mistake and you're dead. No companions also mean that no one is looking out for you. Quilla replied. Lith shrugged while instinctively caressing Solus's ring. He was never really alone. After the others returned, they went to the roof and took flight, following Freya. Rahar caves are a bit far from the city. They are deep inside the Jelugan forest. Freya said in her communication amulet, while flying at high speed it was the only way to keep in touch with others. We'll have time to enjoy the scenery when we get back. Now focus solely on following me and memorizing the course. She sped up, moving south while avoiding flock of birds and the magical beasts soaring the sky in search for their lunch. Normally, the even green ceiling of the forest would have made it impossible for her to find the caves without a guide, but since there were monsters involved, Freya knew she could count on their help. It took them just a couple of minutes of high-speed flight to notice a huge bald spot in the middle of the forest. It was exactly what Freya was looking for. Unlike what happened in fairy tales, monsters didn't draw sustenance from thin air, allowing them to remain holed up in their dungeon 24-7. They needed to eat, drink, and crap like anyone else, which usually meant bad news for the local fauna. Chapter 789 Weeds Part 1 The members of the fallen races had an astounding spawn rate. It gave them an appetite for food matched only by their thirst for battle. Yet Freya didn't expect to find a bald area of that size. It surrounded the caves for a space of over 100 meters, 328 feet, and to make things even more unsettling, it wasn't just trees that had been cut down. Even the grass was missing, along with any trace of wildlife. Freya's hand emitted two consecutive short pulses of light, signaling everyone to stop. Doesn't this remind you of something? She pointed at the familiar scenery. It looks like the place where I killed the abomination in the White Griffin Forest. Lith replied. Yet too many things don't add up. I doubt this is the work of an abomination. What do you mean? Floria asked. Abominations were rare creatures, even rarer than awakened. If not for Balkier using them for his revenge, they would have still been considered just a myth. A newborn abomination would have eaten much more than that, whereas an adult abomination would have never been so obvious. They are apex predators, not morons. They all had seen what had happened to the Academy's forest and the Tron Woods. Years had passed and they both had yet to completely recover. Could this be one of those hybrids you told us about? Like that thing you fought in the mines? After all, the report mentions the presence of an unknown race of monsters. What if they are just a known race mutated by an abomination? Freya said. Unlikely. Quilla had just finished casting a life-sensing array. I've studied lots of samples from both Balkir's minions and captured hybrids. They all have one thing in common. While undead are not detected by life-sensing arrays, all creatures who have abomination blood gets detected as a negative life force. It's something that doesn't make sense, but at the same time makes them incredibly easy to find. I can clearly sense a lot of life forces below us. They are unusual, but that's to be expected. Each race has its own life force, and that of monsters is usually twisted beyond recognition. The group landed gracefully without making a sound. Lith activated life vision and Solus started to scan their surroundings. They both agreed with Quilla's evaluation. There was no trace of black cores or chaos magic in the air. Also, if it really was the work of a hybrid abomination, Lith knew that it would have attempted to train its thralls to hasten its development, whereas the creatures he could spot through the ground had weak cores. Too weak for awakened creatures that had already had enough time to practice accumulation. The inception of this chapter's publication is linked to N0V3LD, B1N. Everyone prepared their spells before discussing what to do. The caves had more than one access, making it easy to fall victim to an attack from behind. Three small stone arches lead into the ground and were covered in footprints. 
The lack of grass coupled with the soft soil gave them plenty of clues about the nature of the threat at hand. Whatever it was, they were heavy, with claws on their feet, and each individual weighted at least 100 kilograms, 221 pounds. What's the plan? Lith asked. Usually, I'll have you guys go down while I search the forest for ingredients. Floria said while digging from the ground the remains of what once was a precious stone flower. Yet since the nature of our enemy is unknown, it's too dangerous to split up. Lith and I will cover your back. You focus only on defending yourself, Quilla. She was aware of Litha's life vision, so by teaming up with him it was impossible to take them by surprise. They had just nodded when Quilla fell on her knees, panting. Gods, how do you guys manage to keep tier 5 spells at the ready with such ease? Keeping the life-sensing array plus several powerful spells had drained her until she had lost her focus. We don't. Freya replied, I've prepared just a few tier 3 and a dimensional spell in case things go bad. Couldn't you tell me earlier? We have yet to start, and I've already wasted a lot of mana. Quilla was so pissed off while drinking a tonic that even the gulping sounds she emitted sounded grumpy. The burned hand teaches best, Lith said. He had only prepared a blink to keep his mind clear and focused. With Ruin at his side and Solus telling him that there was no one in a hundred meters radius, he had no reason to worry. Quilla replied in a very creative and impolite way that would have made a sailor blush. Then, she prepared a few spells and took the stone arch on the right, where her array had spotted the biggest number of creatures. She preferred to take them on while she had still plenty of stamina. Also, that way she would be able to kill many monsters with a single spell. Have you noticed that there's no smell in here? Floria asked. Yep, the air is too clean, both inside and outside the caves. Either this is the first race of monsters to care for personal hygiene, or things are going to get weird. Lith had cleared dozens of dungeons in the Keller region, and the Rothar Caves barely qualified as one. If not for the footprints outside, and the havoc the creatures had caused, the area was too clean. There were no bones laying around, no blood spats, nor the marks that the constant quarreling between monsters usually left everywhere. There was too much order under the thin layer of chaos of the caves to not stir Litha's paranoia. Yet the deeper they went, the less he felt threatened. According to Solus, their mana cores were weak and their life forces unremarkable. It's not any race of monsters we have ever met, she thought. Their energy signature is too weird. Quilla had no way to know that, and even though Freya was just a couple of steps behind her, she was as tense as a bowstring. She was wearing Orion's night vision goggles to avoid the need of light, plus she had cast spells that cancelled her smell and the noise of her steps, yet she still felt insecure. She had seen too many horrors to be scared by monsters, yet there was something in the reading she had gotten from her earlier array that kept bugging her. She was trying to sort out her thoughts without losing her focus when two creatures stepped from around the corner, yelping at the sight of intruders. They were yellow-skinned humanoids, standing 1.9 meters, 6 feet 3 inches, tall with long pointed ears and nose. They had long dirty brown hair all around their head, making it look like a mane, white eyes, and teeth so big that they were visible even when their mouth was closed since their lips barely covered their gums. They were holding thick three branches that could barely pass for clubs. Quilla immediately recognized them from the bestiary she had read at the academy. They were bugbears, another failed mutation in the goblin race in the attempt to recover from their fallen state. They were bigger and stronger than their forefathers, but also more stupid. They had obtained a greater physical strength in exchange for their magical talents. She didn't have the time to wonder how could anyone had mistaken them for an unknown race when the bugbears screamed their challenge and charged towards her. Chapter 790 Weeds Part 2 she unleashed a simple tier 3 spell, Windblade, that was supposed to chop off their legs and chests at the same time. Although deep, the wounds opened by her spell turned out to be far from lethal, stopping even before reaching the bones. The bugbear stumbled just for a second before swallowing their pain and resuming the charge. Seriously? A tier 1 spell? Freya was flabbergasted. It was a tier 3. Quilla rebuked her while unleashing a second wind blade, aimed exactly where the first had struck. 
The air spell managed to cut the bugbear's femoral artery and pierce their lungs, making the creatures drown in their own blood. First, you shouldn't have let them call for reinforcements. Second, there's no way that a tier three didn't kill them on the spot from that distance. Freya spoke as softly as she could, but the annoyance in her voice was unmistakable. I know I messed up, but that's also because of your false information. As for the spells, I swear that I only prepared tier three. Quilla was cut short when one of the maces struck Freya's head, sending her sprawling on the floor. Quilla turned around just in time to dodge the one aimed at her. The two bugbears were standing up. The wounds on their bodies were barely visible. Since when do bugbears have regenerative powers? Quilla thought while unleashing the Tier 3 Frostcutter spell. Icicles the size of an arm pierced the creature's heads and chests, turning them froze solid in the process. This time she also used first magic to alter the ground so that they would fall onto rock spikes that easily penetrated through the frozen meat, destroying the brain and the heart at the same time. Afraid of the bugbear's recovery abilities, this time Quilla cut off their heads before worrying about her sister. Freya? Quilla asked, incapable of making heads or tails of that situation. Her sister was wearing a skinwalker armor, and the mace was just a piece of wood. It wasn't supposed to do her any harm, no matter the amount of strength behind the hit. Lith was amazed as well, but compared to his friend, he had more clues. Quilla was right about everything. Bugbears weren't supposed to regenerate, nor would could harm someone wearing an enchanted armor, let alone one of his making. The problem was that it wasn't wood and that those weren't bugbears, or at least not completely. The two corpses stood up again, uncaring for the missing heads or the gaping hole where once a heart resided. Undead? Floria asked while unsheathing her sword. No, plants. Lith replied. A split second later roots and vines filled the empty space in the creature's chest and a sapling grew out from their necks. Quilla had enough of that madness, so she used the only tier 5 spell she had at the ready. Volcano was a mix of fire and earth magic that turned the ground below the monsters into molten lava swallowing them whole. The creatures died in an instant, without the time to emit nothing but the smell of sandalwood incense. What the heck happened? Freya's vision was still blurry, but she was otherwise uninjured. Your information network sucks. Quilla replied while checking that she didn't have a concussion. And you're sloppy, Lith said, throwing the clubs into the still fiery pit. The wood split and germinated into small tendrils that tried to escape death, but the lava turned them into cinders before they could reach the safety of the ceiling. The screeching sounds of agony cleared all doubts about how Freya had been stunned. Those things were not their weapons, but part of their bodies. Once you saw that we are not dealing with bugbears, but with some kind of parasite, you should have disposed of all the wood in sight. What the heck? The three women said in unison. This doesn't make sense. Plants creatures are rare, and I've never heard about them being parasites. I work with them for years at the White Griffin. Some of them are my good friends. Quilla's brain felt as if it was burning. Why would plants damage vegetation, and how the heck did they took over the bugbears? I have no idea. Even according to Litha's books, the entire situation was simply absurd. He had understood the nature of their enemy only because the clubs had the same life force and a mana flow that coursed under the monster's skin. What do you want to do? Lith asked Quilla. This isn't a learning experience anymore, but a frigging mess. Which makes it perfect as a learning experience. She replied. Nothing ever goes according to plan, and not only must I learn how to handle high-level spells, but also how to keep my cool when the unexpected happens. The enemy has called for reinforcements, so we don't have much time. Remember that plants are not weak to fire like most people think since they are not made of dried wood, but from living tissues rich in water. On top of that, they have an outstanding ability in manipulating both their bodies and earth magic. Their real weaknesses are water and darkness magic. The cold blocks their regenerative and shape-shifting abilities, so focus on that. Due to her job as assistant professor, Quilla knew a lot about plant creatures compared to her companions, Lith included. Knowing their real enemy and its weakness, it took the four of them just a few hours to kill all the infested bugbears. Quilla even made a few attempts to communicate whenever they isolated a single specimen, but they proved to be unwilling or incapable of explaining their reasons. By the time they were done, 
they had more questions than answers. Sentient plants had coexisted with Moger's other races for ages, and their existence was well documented. The appearance of a new species, and one so aggressive at that, was a bad sign. We have to report this immediately, Floria said. If they can take over bugbears, they might do the same with humans. We need to put people on alert before the phenomenon becomes widespread. Yeah, too bad that we can't examine a body. It would greatly help me to understand what's going on, Quilla said. She had gained a lot of experience and her learning rate was terrifying. After just a few tries, she had become able to use some tier 5 spells in confined spaces without harming her allies. What do you mean? Lith had collected a few bodies precisely to study their altered physiology. Sorry, I forgot to tell you earlier. Plants don't leave any corpse behind. The moment they die, they also wither, reverting to their original form. So if these things started out as flowers, you'll only get a flower. It's the reason why plants cannot be turned into undead. Quilla said. Fuck me sideways. I could have played a little with them and used invigoration instead of wasting time speaking. How is their core, Solus? Lith thought. Sorry, I have no clue. By invading the bugbear's body in the form of vines, they also spread their core, making it invisible to my mana sense. It's the same thing that happened with the plant abomination. We needed to force it all in one place to see its core. What I can tell you for sure is that it couldn't be very strong since if it wasn't for the animated clubs, their mana flow was perfectly eclipsed by their victim's weak-ass core. Finally, some good news. Lith inwardly sighed in relief. Luckily, we picked a city with a gate, so whatever this is, the kingdom can take care of it on its own.